You likely learned something in school about the history of the Acadians, Nova Scotia's first European settlers. In this presentation, we'll review that history of their settlement, their dike building that left a significant mark on our Nova Scotian landscape, and then we shall take a closer look at East Hans and the Acadian presence here. In researching for this presentation, I discovered that there's not much written about the Acadians on the East Hans side of the Cobbigwood Bay compared to other areas. Part of the reason for that likely is that the Acadian population density was much greater elsewhere, and much of what is remembered today comes from local lore. I want to say from the outset that I am deeply indebted to Sean and Todd Scott of Knoll, whose excellent and thoroughly documented presentation to the Royal Nova Scotia Historical Society on Noel Doiron has informed much of what I shall say about our Cobbiquid Acadians. More later on Noel Doiron. I also want to say here before we go on that the images you see on the slides are mostly in the public domain. However, there are six done by Claude Picard, a New Brunswick artist, in his Deportation from Grand Prix series that his widow Jeanne and his daughter Brigitte have given us permission to use. We thank them for this. A quick look at the timeline shows the first arrival of Samuel de Champlain in 1604, an ill-fated first start, a return the next year to Port Royal, and a better start, in part because of the aid given by the Mi'kmaq under their Sagamore member two. What then followed was further settlement, the establishment of Sieur de Mont's seigneury, which was then revoked, the destruction of Port Royal by New Englander Samuel Argall, and an effort by a Scottish nobleman to settle near Port Royal, and then war between the French and the British. From there on, Acadie, Nova Scotia, was lobbed back and forth between the French and the British like a massive ping-pong ball. In 1713, the Treaty of Utrecht gave ownership of Acadie to the British. Under this treaty, the British received mainland Nova Scotia, while the French retained Ile Royale, Cape Breton, where they eventually built the fortress Louisbourg, and Ile Saint-Jean, PEI. It was an uneasy truce, mostly because the British did not trust their Acadian subjects not to support the French in the event of French pushback against the British. The Acadians wished only to live their peaceful lives, trade with both the French and the British, and raise their crops and their families. After Utrecht, they did swear an oath of allegiance, but only with the spoken agreement that they would not be called on to fight against the French. However, it was an uneasy arrangement, as the British were very aware that, along with the French troops at Ile Saint-Jean and Ile Royale, the Acadians outnumbered them. After 1746, the Acadians felt the repercussions of the Battle of Culloden in Scotland, after which the English, under Lieutenant General Edward Cornwallis, massacred the Lochaber Scots and leveled their lands. Because of their Roman Catholic faith, the Acadians were stripped of civil and political rights, eventually having their travel restricted and their firearms confiscated when they further refused the unconditional oath of allegiance. The issue ramped up with the founding of Halifax by Cornwallis, which caused the Acadians to consider the fragility of their position in Acadie. They could no longer enjoy the freedoms they once had. This was compounded in the early 1750s by the arrival of the foreign Protestants from Germany, Switzerland and Montbelliard, although these did not directly threaten Acadian lands or people as they populated Halifax and then what is today Lunenburg. By the beginning of the French and Indian War, what we learned in school was the Seven Years' War, many Acadians had quietly slipped away, going to Ile Saint-Jean or farther west and north toward New France or Quebec. Let's take a closer look at some of the factors involved. The Oath of Allegiance. The British feared the possibility of Acadian support for the French. However, they wanted them to remain where they were, as the British were dependent on them as the source of their food supply. The British had no cultivated farmland of their own at this point, nor the farmers to work the land. That, plus the fear the Acadians would actively fight for the French, was a big problem for the British. However, the Acadians were willing to swear the oath of allegiance, believing that they were guaranteed their neutrality. Oh yes, they were assured that was written in the margins, but it wasn't. 
Here you can see the British problem. They have two presences in Nova Scotia at this point, the Red Stars at Halifax and Annapolis Royal. While the French have significant presence, not only in Ile Saint-Jean and Ile Royale, but farther to the north and west in a much more populous French territory the French still own. Their presence there was a big headache for the New England territories that bordered on it and scattered here and there along the Fundy coast as far east as Truro and parts of the Atlantic coast are the Acadians, the neutral French. On top of that, the French had an agitator in the form of Abbé Jean-Louis Le Loutre. At the 100th anniversary in 1903 in Maitland of the ordination of Reverend Alexander Dick, Reverend T. Chalmers Jack, in a review of local history, calls Le Loutre, quote, a man of boundless egotism, a violent spirit of domination, with an intense hatred of the English, and a fanaticism that stopped at nothing. Toward the Acadians, he was a despot, and this simple and superstitious people, extremely susceptible to the influence of their priests, trembled before him." Unquote. Le Loutre first arrived at Acadie to, to minister to the Mi'kmaq. Reverend Jack concludes, Le Loutre was a major irritation to the English and thus bears some responsibility for the English order to expatriate the Acadians. He incited the Mi'kmaq to, quote, murder the English, and on the other hand, to terrify the Acadians, end quote. Cornwallis offered a hundred pounds for his head. Governor Charles Lawrence was another actor in this drama. By 1752, Governor Cornwallis was gone and Lawrence was in his place. Charles Morris, New Englander, was a surveyor brought in to lay out townships and land grant boundaries. He knew the Nova Scotia landscape like the back of his hand. Governor Shirley in New England likewise played a role in supplying New Englanders to bolster the British troops. These three shared a hatred for the French that was the product of centuries of animosity between the French and the English, plus a hatred for the Roman Catholic faith. Charles Morris had his eye on the land, as did Governor Shirley. Whether the Acadians were removed or not, Shirley believed a stronger British presence was needed in Nova Scotia as a bulwark against the French in the territories they occupied. Also in New England, the growth and migration of the population westward was up against the Appalachian Mountains and all that prime cultivated marshland in Nova Scotia looked really appealing. These three leaders vilified the Acadians as ambitionless, a simple unsophisticated people who wasted all that good upland because they were too lazy to cut the trees down and cultivate it. Therefore, the order to deport was pretty much a done deal in their eyes quote, a great and noble scheme, unquote, as someone called it. In New England, Protestant clerics were stirring up anti-Roman Catholic feeling as well. Jo Colonel John Winslow had no trouble raising a force of New England militia to sail to Nova Scotia to begin the expulsion. On September 5th, 1755, he read the official deportation order to a room full of Acadian men who, although they were uneasy about the arrival of the British ships riding high on the water a few days earlier, apparently had no idea this was to be their fate. The actual deportation took place over the years 1755 into the early 1760s. Beaubassin in the Chignecto area was the first to be raised, followed by the Grand Pré Pisiquid habitations. On this chart, the red arrows represent the Acadian flight ahead of the deportation. Their move out into what is now New Brunswick and into New France and the islands off the Newfoundland coast, St. Pierre and Miquelon. Those who did not manage to escape were loaded onto ships, taking them to seaports along the American coast. Were these American towns and cities happy to see so many refugees offloaded onto their territories? Not so much. And in fact, Virginia turned one boatload away, which instead sailed for England. However, you can see from the green arrows that the refugee Acadians in many cases took affairs into their own hands and began the trek northward in their attempt to return to Nova Scotia or New France. 
The British idea was that distributing the French-speaking Acadians among the American colonies would dilute their language and culture and assimilate them into American society, thus dispersing the danger. Between 1758 and 1762, the most notable removal was of the Acadians who had fled to Ile Saint-Jean, the thick blue arrow you see that took them to France. We'll look into that a bit further on. You can also see a blue arrow pointed at both ends toward both Nova Scotia and Boston. A shipload of Acadian men who had been imprisoned in Halifax for refusing the oath were shipped to Boston, which refused to allow them to be offloaded, and so they were returned to Halifax. You can also see by the green arrows the movement of the Acadians themselves, both back toward the north, but also into Louisiana, where there was already a French population, and where they established the Cajun culture we know today. There was a final wave of Acadian migration between the end of the Seven Years' War and 1767, when the British agreed to permit Acadians to resettle in Nova Scotia, although not on the lands they had left behind. Those had already been snapped up by the planter settlements of the early 1760s, New Englanders and Scots-Irish. You could see the scope of Acadian migrations into Louisiana and the West Indies, into South America, French Guiana, as far south as the Falkland Islands, and to parts of France. It is estimated that the pre-deportation numbers ranged between 15,000 and 18,000 men, women, and children, with the children outnumbering the adults. Families were large. Of those, likely about 70% were deported, the rest managed to avoid capture. Of those deported, huge numbers died aboard ship of miserable, unsanitary, crowded conditions where disease and starvation took them. Those deported from Ile Saint-Jean were already in poor physical condition due to the years of famine the island had suffered. Shipwreck accounted for additional loss of life. More about that shortly. Those who returned to Nova Scotia, as I noted before, did not regain their lost property and possessions that they had sunk their hearts and souls into over the pre-expulsion generations, and it would be a long time before they would achieve recognition as a distinct culture within Nova Scotia. We're all familiar with the Henry Wadsworth Longfellow poem Evangeline, which tells the story of a betrothed couple, Gabrielle and Evangeline, wrenched apart by the deportation shipped separately to different locations and wandering the rest of their lives looking for each other, with Evangeline finding Gabrielle as he lies on his deathbed in old age and dies in her arms. A heart-wrenching story, for sure, but with a romantic tinge that belies the hard-cold reality of the Grand Arrangement, families separated, children effectively orphaned, the horrific loss of life, but also the loss of state and cultural identity. The great legacy of the early Acadians in Nova Scotia is the diking technology they brought with them from France and used to hold back the Fundy Tides, rendering otherwise unusable marshland able to be cultivated. Although I've read in places that this was a technology they developed after arriving here and seeing the potential of the marshlands, I have also read that one of the French kings brought experts from the Netherlands, the ultimate in diked territory, to coastal France to teach coastal farmers their techniques. Building dikes without modern equipment was no mean feat. A dike is a wall constructed to hold back tidal water. It is brought at the base, with sluices or abateau through it to manage water runoff from the land side. Abateau have clapper valves in them that close when the outside tide rises to them, effectively shutting off the return of salt water to the reclaimed marshland. The marsh is ditched and crowned to aid in runoff of water to ditches that lead to the abateau. Once a dike was completed, the marshland behind it would be left for a couple of years so that rain and snow would wash the salt out of the soil, leaving it fit for cropping. Building the dike was a large community effort and one that required some haste as it needed to be completed, at least in part, between high tides.
The only tool used was a diking spade, which had a very sharp cutting edge. Building the dike involved setting posts upright in the marsh to anchor the dike, then building a sawed wall on both sides at least a foot thick. The cavity between the walls was packed with tree limbs, sod, and mud. The strength of the dike was dependent on two things, the kind of sods used and the quality of the stacking of them. Saws were cut from the marsh rush and salt hay grass, which both have very dense root systems. Saws would be maybe three inches thick and flat with about a 12 by 12 inch dimension, like a thick floor tile or a large square brick. They would be laid in the same way bricks are laid to make a wall, but underlapped, so to speak, so that they formed a sloped outer surface with a greater slope on the water side of the dike so that the incoming tide would push downward rather than inward. The roots of the sods would grow together to form a wall very resistant to the effects of the tide and erosion. These two images show the lay of the land on either side of a dike. In the upper image, you can see the haystacks on the land side of the dike. The Acadians also cut the salt marsh hay on the water side. They build structures called staddles, a kind of platform that allowed them to store their hay above the high tide mark until it could be taken off the marsh. In our lifetime, I'm told, one could still see staddles on the marsh at Knoll Bay here in East Hants. So let's look at the story of the East Hants Acadians. The first reference we have is that in 1689, Mathieu Martin was granted a seigneury at Cobequid. It started opposite the mouth of the Shibanakadi River and extended inland along both sides of the Cobequid River, which is a Salmon River, according to a Charles Morris map of 1749. That would be toward Old Barnes and Truro of today, where it reads, quote, on the south side of the river crossing to the west-northwest, unquote, the river in question is the Cobequid or Salmon River and the west-northwest direction would be along the north shore of what we today call the Cobequid Bay, but was then known as the head of the Minas Basin. If we take this grant description literally, it would not seem to include any part of East Hans. This isn't a great representation of a 1756 map of the area, but if you look carefully, you can see the Cobequid River here, the Shibanakadi River here, the Minas Basin. The large mass between the north and south shores of the head of the Minas Basin represents the mudflats at low tide. You can see that most of the settlements are on the Cobequid River and along the north shore. The map also shows Ville Hébert at the mouth of the Stuyac River, today's Fort Ellis in Colchester County, and the site of the Mass House at Shubenacadie. Along the East Hans shoreline, settlement is noted at Petite Rivière, Walton, and at Knoll and Maitland. A number of census records of Acadian habitats were taken, usually by parish priests, starting in the early days of settlement, some of which have survived. Here you can see the 1714 census record for Calbiquid, 159 citizens in total. Here is Mathieu Martin, the seigneur, and some of these names appear in other records, some British records, for various reasons. The next Calbiquid census I could find is not until about 1751-52. The intervening years are probably lost. We don't know where in Calbiquid these people lived, although we will speak of one, Noel Doiron, shortly. In the 1750-51 census, these are all that are officially left in Cobequid by this time, although the deportation announcement has not yet been issued. Only 32 people. Where are the descendants of the families on the 1714 census? In hiding, but most likely having decamped for safer regions, into what's today New Brunswick or farther into New France. Many went to Ile Saint-Jean, specifically a coastal place called Pointe Prime, east of today's Charlottetown. This map, identified only as the British King map of 1756, shows a survey of the East Hans coastline with a count of the number of habitations at each location. At Petite Rivière, Walton, we can see five. 
A survey in 1748 had shown four. East of Petite Riviere, we find Grand Anse, or Big Cove, today's Tenacape. This survey map overlooks it, likely because it was small. A 1767 survey shows the remains of two habitations. When we come further east, we can see around Knoll Bay at least 13 habitations. The west side of the bay was named Ville Noël, and the consensus is that it was named after Noël Doiron, who had lived there a good deal of his adult life, raised a family there, and was essentially the patriarch of the village. Here, there are seven abandoned habitations. In their work on the Acadians, Sean and Todd Scott maintained that the east side of Knoll Bay was Ville Robert, where there were six habitations. There has been some discussion about this, as some have maintained that present-day Maitland was actually Ville Robert. As we shall see, the Scots make a, make a convincing argument as to why this may not be so. Farther east is Knoll Shore, not shown on this map, but on the 1750 Floyer map, 1754 Floyer map, pardon me, there were two habitations. My Densmore mother grew up in Knoll Shore on what is today known as Kings Creek Farm. And when she was a young girl, her grandmother told her that the grave markers in the fence line between their farm and the McClellan one east of it were Acadian markers. They're long gone, eroded into the bay. Also, there was a small orchard on the south side of today's Highway 215 that family lore refers to as the French Orchard. Pré à Briard, Selma, and Ville Jean Peter, Maitland, sort of get run together as one. The map shows Ville Jean Peter as having two habitations. Up the Shubenacadie River, then South Maitland, then Rhines Creek, and the Mass House to St. Anne at Shubenacadie. All this may have been primarily a Mi'kmaq encampment rather than an Acadian settlement. Let's look at the marsh sites we pinpointed on the map. At Rhines Creek, you can see the creek cross under the highway here and meander inland. The site is opposite the larger Ville Hébert site, now Fort Ellis, which is a much larger expanse of marshland. I don't know if there were ever any habitations at Rhines Creek, but we do know it was diked. I found a deed for property owned by a Francis MacDonald that references the dike and Abateau as benchmarks for his property boundaries. At South Maitland, the mouth of the Five Mile River, we find a large expanse of marsh. South Maitland resident Grace Gray, a normal college student in Truro in 1907, wrote an essay on the history of South Maitland, and she includes details about the diking and the location of remnants of an Acadian cellar and some graves on a Putnam farm, which would be located further north and to the uh, far right of this image, beyond this image. This recent photo of the South Maitland Marsh was taken from near the Goss Bridge. The snow on the dike clearly marks its location, which I've outlined in red. You can see the same location here in bird's eye view at high tide, and the line of the dike can be clearly seen. You'll note other lines on this plot of marsh as well. This one drains into the river, and if you look carefully, you can see lines that likely mark the remains of additional drainage ditches. Remember, the Acadians crowned the land so that the dales, as they were called, drained toward the river or the bay. This Charles Morris map of 1752 shows the mouth of the Five Mile River here, and farther north, Jean Peter's village at the mouth of the Shubenacadie River here, with the note that the four habitations are abandoned. Jean Peter is likely an attempt by Morris to write Jean in French, Pitre, who, who was known as a Cobbicud resident. Another possibility is it could have been Pierre Le Jeune de Briard. This projection on the map here would be Salter's head. And it's interesting to note that Morris doesn't note the presence of the village at Selma, which others have named pre a -Briard. We don't have a date on this postcard titled The Marsh Road, Maitland, NS, but we do know it dates back to the early 20th century, probably before 1920. 
This is the road leading west out of Maitland toward the Lawrence House here. This side road is probably today's Maple Street. The brown building was a blacksmith shop. You can't really see the dike, but the 1871 Ambrose Church map of Hans County shows it to be along here, more or less guarding the village proper from flood tides. The dike went out sometime about 1920. In the boat, you can see my father-in-law, Ken Whidden, standing with his sister, Lucy, seated behind him. The man pushing off is Percy Scott, who grew up in the Gore and was in Maitland at the time to attend school, according to his niece. The point where they are pushing off is just beyond that brown blacksmith shop in the previous slide. And this, of course, shows the quantity of water that comes through when the dike is breached. This image shows the proximity across country of the Maitland Marsh from the Selma Marsh. Salter's head, higher in elevation, is positioned between the two as you round out of the Shibanakadee River into the bay. Today, the new dike at Maitland closes off a good deal of the marsh that we saw in the previous slides, and the Ducks Unlimited Pond further isolates a segment of the marsh from the rest of it. If you follow this path here, which at one time was the old Selma Road, and if you figure in the elevations, you will see that this area is lowland ending in marsh at both ends. With this area, Salter's head at, an higher, at a higher elevation above it. At Maitland here, the Oak Island Cemetery is located. And many years ago, many decades ago, I should say, in a tree planting session on the island, a casket with the remains of a young girl believed to be Acadian shrouded in linen was dug up. Christina Ross Frame makes mention of this in her memoir, Golden Years of Acadie. Frame grew up in Selma and she writes of the French field and three gnarled old apple trees, generally referred to as the French trees. She also writes of drainage work done by later settlers that brought up tools from Acadian days, looking as if they had been buried against the anticipated return someday of their owners. She writes too of gold coins likewise buried, perhaps because it seemed safer to stash them here than to carry them off into the unknown. This suggests the Acadians really did expect the whole expulsion thing to blow over and to be able to someday return to their properties. We'll skip past Knoll for the moment to Walton and then come back. At Walton, Petite Riviere, the Walton River meanders quite a distance inland and the possibilities of good arable land are apparent. Likewise, here at Tenecape, La Grande Anse or Big Cove, Today's highway effectively dikes it. This slide shows the extent of the Acadian settlement at Knoll Bay, the largest in East Hans. Burnt Coat Head is west of this site, and there are references in accounts from the previously mentioned expeditions to a steeple point, Point Clochet, where an Acadian chapel was documented. Here to the east is today's Sunny Point Farm, whose owners farm a large expanse of the marsh. Sean and Todd Scott concluded in their research that the westernmost habitation was Villa Noel, the name found among British documents, the eastern Ville Robert, as noted earlier in this presentation. Ville Robert lies at the mouth of East Knoll Creek, known as Petit Trajeptic, its earlier Mi'kmaq name, on the east side of Knoll Bay. You can see the line of the dike starting here and note the tremendous amount of waterside marsh that would also have been a significant source of salt marsh hay, which would have been cured on staddles like those we saw in the earlier slide. Grand Trajeptic is Villa Noel. Again, you can see the line of the dike here Knoll River here. For either of these Knoll Bay images, I can't say how much of the dikes are of Acadian origin or of later British settlers. 
the O'Briens were the first settlers here some 20 years or so after the Acadians were gone. How much of the original dikes were left then? I don't know. Given what we know about the dikes in the windsor pisiquid region at the time, and that the British made use of Acadian prisoners earlier to repair, it's likely the Knoll dikes were in need of attention by the time the O'Briens arrived. The most poignant story out of the East Hans portion of the expulsion is that of Noel Doiron and his family. His story starts well before Noel was settled and well before the Acadian lands became British territory. In 1704, New Englanders led by Benjamin Church attacked Port Royal and took 100 hostages to trade for New England hostages that had been taken by forces in New France. The border between New England and New France was ever a troubled one. Noel Doiron and his future wife, Marie Henri, were among the captured. The captives spent a couple of years idling in Boston, free to wander about, much to the dismay of Bostonians, and there are baptismal and marriage records for the couple in 1706 in Boston. Two years later, Noel and Marie are back in Acadie, and by 1714, the year of the census we looked at earlier, they are at Noel Bay. Note that Noel Doiron was not the original founder of Noel, but a man by the name Martin Henri de Robert. We know from census records that Noel and Marie had five sons and three daughters. In 1724, Noel Doiron was involved in a dispute over Mathieu Martin's will. Remember, Martin was the seigneur of Cobequid, another bit of evidence that the East Hans Acadians were considered part of the Cobequid seigneury. Mathieu Martin died without issue and named Noel and several others as his heirs. After some back and forth in the process, by 1731, nothing happened quickly in those days, the British disallowed their attempt to prove the will and their right to the inheritance on the basis that Martin had not sworn the oath of allegiance. So the Cobbegood Seigneury became crown land. By 1748, Noel Doiron was the village patriarch. The Acadians had signaled to the British their preference to leave Acadie altogether rather than swear an oath that might force them to fight against the French. And the 1749 settlement of Halifax essentially marked the beginning of the end. Tensions rose, and leaving Acadie under their own volition seemed preferable to deportation into the unknown. Already they were experiencing restrictions on boat travel beyond Minas Basin. Their vessels were seized by the Crown, their firearms uh, confiscated. They feared loss of their religion if transported to Protestant lands. Their priest had been arrested and was imprisoned in Halifax. He was eventually freed and later joined them. They were also under pressure from the Mi'kmaq who were acting under the direction of Gorham's rangers. Since leaving by boat was impossible, the trek was made across country carrying what possessions they could to the Northumberland coast so they could cross to Ile Saint-Jean. Ile Saint-Jean census records show the Doiron family at Pointe Prime by 1752, where they experienced great hardship because of drought and locusts. There are written descriptions of priests telling of children with little clothing, no shoes, and the misery of famine. It was in 1758 that the British ships came to deport them. Two ships, Duke William and the Violet, carried some 750 Acadians across the Atlantic Ocean. Both ships developed leaks and sank, first the Violet, then the Duke William. Noel, his wife, five married children and their spouses, and more than 30 grandchildren and other extended family were lost December 13, 1758, about 20 leagues off the coast of France. Written records from the captain and perhaps other crewmen state that Noel Doiron implored the captain and his crew to leave, to leave them and save their own lives in the few lifeboats. One record even notes that Noel reprimanded one of the Acadian men for attempting to board a lifeboat, thus abandoning his ch wife and children. The priest blessed them and stepped into a lifeboat too. About the priest, one of my sources states that he retired to France, where he lived out the rest of his life, scorned by his peers because he did not go down with his flock. The captain's record states that the lifeboats remained in the area until the Duke William sank, doing so with a loud explosion as it went down. 
I had not heard this story about Noel Doiron before, and the first time I read it was in Tyler LeBlanc's book, Acadian Driftwood. I thought, well, that's pretty self-serving of the captain to claim that Noel Doiron begged him to save his own life and then to proclaim Noel to be such a fine old gentleman. But then the story came up over and over again, citing the documents to support it, a testament to the esteem in which Noel Doiron was held. And today, we still have his name on the community in which he was a leader. What conclusions can we draw about this significant part of Nova Scotia's history? First, it's likely that the kind of conclusions one draws will depend to some degree on one's own national and religious affiliations. If you are a descendant of planter stock, say, with heritage out of New England, you might agree that the deportation was a great and noble scheme. Beamish Murdoch, planter descendant who wrote the history of Nova Scotia or Acadie in the 1860s, tended not to find a lot of fault with the role of his New England predecessors in the expulsion, at least to a point. I've read at least a couple of times the point of view that the Acadians had no one to blame but themselves for their great upheaval because they refused to become wholehearted and enthusiastic subjects of the British crown because they stuck to their determination not to take up arms against the French. An argument has also been made that, hey, this is the way things were done back then. We can't judge the actions of our ancestors by today's standards with its focus on human rights and democratic principles. There was a lot of illiteracy and simplicity of culture, lack of sophistication, not just among the Acadians, but among British subjects as well. The lords of the manor, whether they were French or British, occupied a social position the ordinary citizen could not aspire to. Many of us today can look back at documents our ancestors signed with an X, his mark, because they could neither read nor write. But in essence, the British were not prepared to accept the distinctness of the Acadian culture, nor believe them when they swore neutrality. To be sure, history records a few among the Acadians whose actions might belie that neutrality claim, but no society has a perfectly in sync population, certainly not today. There is among some historians the belief that the Acadian expulsion was one of the great wrongs in history, that it was an ethnic cleansing. One might quibble over the word ethnic as the Acadians were not of a different ethnicity than the British or other European peoples. However, it could certainly be called a cleansing based on religious beliefs. The hatred the British had for Roman Catholicism had a long and complex history dating back to the Protestant Reformation and later Henry VIII's break with the Roman Church in the 16th century so that he could divorce his first wife. That and later religious issues at rulership levels in Britain are well documented. It was pretty well a given that once dispersed among Protestant populations, the Acadians would not be allowed to publicly practice their faith. However, for those returning to live once again in Nova Scotia, practicing their faith gradually ceased to be a problem. When you hold the deportation of the Acadians up against the events of the modern age, our own, it becomes very difficult to say that such a thing would never happen today. But think about the attempts of the modern German Nazis before and during World War II to purge the world of Jewish people. And both Canada and the United States turned away ships carrying Jewish refugees during that time. Look at the Chinese internment of the Muslim Uyghur in northwest China to re-educate them and make them useful citizens. Or the persecution of the Muslim Rohingya in Myanmar, all based on religion. Although we don't have to look far to find other reasons for persecution. It's not enough to say, oh, well, those are different situations. What it really is, in my opinion, is one of the great human failures, regardless of race, creed, or nationality. Failure to tolerate the other. That's simplistic, but certainly a part of the rationale behind le grand dérangement. <laughs>